Okay, well, it is my great pleasure uh, and honor to introduce Dr. Uh, Jewel Mullen, who uh, is with us this morning. She is a rock star in so many domains, clinical research, teaching, and, and leadership at all levels. Um, so she has a really long and amazing bio. I'm going to give you just a quick, a quick brief of it, but she has a bachelor's degree, Master of Public Health from Yale. She also completed a postdoctoral fellowship in psychosocial epidemiology. Uh, she got her medical degree from Mount Sinai School of Medicine, did a residency at University of Pennsylvania, and also has a master's in public administration from Harvard's JFK School of Government. Um, she has led the charge nationally in creating community-based chronic disease prevention programs and in strengthening the coordination between community, public health, and healthcare systems. Here at UT, she's the Dean for Health Equity at Dell Med and also a professor in the school's population health and internal medicine departments. Before coming to UT, she was the principal deputy assistant professor, a secretary for health in the US Department of Health and Human Services. And she was instrumental in coordinating the federal response to Zika. She was also the acting assistant secretary for health and the acting director of the National Vaccine Program Office during the months that bridged the transition from the Obama to the Trump administration. Also, she has served as the commissioner for the Connecticut Department of Health and had leadership roles in other state um, health departments. Um, and as the Connecticut's public health commissioner, she created an office of health equity research, evaluation and policy focused on reducing racial disparities in low birth weight and infant mortality. And she did a lot of work to improve end of life care. She also, while in that role, directed her agency's response to the tragic shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary and also the Ebola crisis. Um, today, she serves on the editorial board for the CDC's MMWR, Mor Mor Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report, which we have been following very closely throughout COVID. And she has numerous um, national leadership roles. She serves on National Academy of Science, Engineering, Medicine committees. Most recently, she was, uh, she was one of the, the folks who um, developed with the National Academies the Framework for Equitable Allocation of COVID-19 Vaccine, which we've looked at as a consortium. Um, she's been instrumental in our local COVID response, and I had the great privilege of getting to know her and learn from her and see her kind of really provide very wise and um, compassionate guidance uh, early on in the pandemic, and I know she has ever since. And so it's really an honor to have her here today, and with that, I'll hand, hand the stage to you. So thank you. That was a very gracious introduction. You could have just said, I've gotten to work with you. So thank you, Lauren. Uh, and Lauren, you totally distracted me because I knew just what I was going to say until you started listing today's news. So I just want to say a couple of things. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, because I think what I'll just reference also helps frame our conversation. Uh, so let me just start with Yes, I have worked in government, and I, I don't think I've ever had a leaked email. It's something I have always tried to avoid, um, but it's not easy. Um, because Dr. Bill Fagey, who is legendary, um, was um, the co-chair of our study committee, um, now I'm also going to find it very interesting to consider um, what, what kind of legs his leaked email gets, because having worked with him I know so many of us are just trying to stand up for sound public health and science and the people who do it inside of and outside of government. And when I talk to the media now, I just thank them for any time they reach out to any of us who are, are on the outside, because I think we have such an important role, um, just getting the information out and being able to convey that there is something that's solid and credible when you can also say these are estimates and this is what we think today and we will keep refining our learning and telling you more because I think that's actually trust building rather than trust eroding, especially at a time when people want absolutes. So I offer you that as well because of the work that you do and where would we be without some kind of framework to help people understand that when experts are projecting what might happen and how much better or worse things could be, they're not just making things up. They're actually relying on sound science to even come up with those estimates. 
Um, just in terms of Alexa, does somebody sound sick? I will confess that I have been watching um, tiny bits of news clips over the past few days trying to figure out whether or not the person talking to the public with his mask off has had a voice that changed, trying to do what they taught us early in medical school, like pay attention to your patient and maybe you'll figure out whether or not they're sick. I can't tell you. And then finally, just in terms of uh, this wanting to sort of support public health and CDC, um, I had a conversation with a former uh, colleague from CDC last night and what we said is, we do want to send affirm affirming messages to our colleagues who still work there. I don't know Dr. Redfield, but we're also very sensitive to how hard it is for them to even let us support them sometimes because they're, they're, they're under so much scrutiny. So these are really, really challenging times. And all that being said, thank you for giving me a chance to decide what nuggets of information I can best share with you this morning uh, because I know whatever it is, you're going to take it and, and, and put it into the mix of everything else you're working on and continue to provide some sound information to, to be part of the decision making teams about what we do to add COVID-19 vaccines to the armamentarium for stemming this pandemic. And I just say add because every time people say they're just waiting for a vaccine, I worry that they're, they're thinking they can suddenly just stop doing the things that we're still trying to get them to do more of, like stay distanced and wear masks and wash their hands and do be safe. So I didn't create PowerPoints, I, but I'm gonna put up one slide. Um, and Lauren, I can send you anything that you want that to share with the group that might be easy to look at. So the, the, the study report that was released to the public last Friday on vaccine allocation actually was the work of a committee that only had its first meeting on July 24th. And we finished this report through approval and release uh, for last Friday. We worked intensively, days, had weekend meetings, and did a lot of writing back and forth in between. And the reason we were convened was to do part of what CDC and NIH, who uh, sponsored the report, asked for, which was to try to bring some equity, some sense of fairness into um, a pandemic response that people have not been able to see much equity within, either because of um, the disparities that we've observed um, related to morbidity and mortality, or because of the unevenness of resource distribution for even being able to take care of people, test people, et cetera. So we were asked to um, uh, provide a framework for reducing severe morbidity and mortality, and I'm reading, and the negative societal impact due to the transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and, and our work is not a mandate, it's not guidelines that one must follow, but it's really uh, a document that we say started with ethics and equity, but is always evidence-based to assist and guide federal government and decision-making bodies, including the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, state, tribal, territorial, local authorities, and how to allocate the COVID vaccine. And I think we're probably all familiar with the annual uh, recommendations that the ACIP makes for which, say, which flu vaccine. Every summer we find out which flu vaccine products are going to be best um, tailored to specific populations. So this report is not a replacement for that. It's actually uh, the ACIP doesn't do the let's start with equity and equality and equal regard first, although they take these things in mind. So this is also a guide for them. We did our work based on foundational principles, three ethical principles, maximum benefit, equal concern for all, and mitigation of health inequities, and three procedural principles of fairness, transparency, and remaining evidence-based. And, and using all of that, 
what we wanted to do was establish criteria that people could use for allocating vaccine. And the considerations that we emphasized were people's risk of acquiring infection, their risk of severe morbidity and mortality associated with COVID, the risk of negative societal impact. For example, what happens if all the heads of your military are suddenly sick? or all your first responders or your healthcare providers, and the risk of transmission of disease to others. And as we did this, we, we tackled questions that maybe you all have wondered about, such as how, how does race, how do race and ethnicity factor in? Should those be criteria in and of themselves? And what, what's the upside of that? What's the downside of that? Is that flawed reasoning? And along the way, what we determined was that race you know, either biologic, um, race, um, or just that demographic characteristic was less salient than the social characteristics that are more prevalent among the racial and ethnic groups who are most impacted. So, so rather than, and we also acknowledged that um, if you look at the New York Times page, uh, front page today, there's also an article that underscores the, the risk, uh, the concern about ex still ongoing experimentation and uh, sort of discrimination against minoritized communities. So we thought we would actually be making moving in the wrong direction to try to say, um, we made this vaccine for you. Trust us that that wasn't going to go very far. And, and so with that then, we established phases that I will, I'm going to share with you. You might have seen this already. Hopefully everyone can see that. We did not want to convey that we were prioritizing people. If we're talking about equal regard and equal concern for people, we didn't want to have priority groups or tiers because there's such a hierarchical connotation to that. So the phases, which I won't talk you through, we looked at as saying, when there is a vaccine or a, a couple are available, they will be in limited supply. So who should get it first based on scarcity? And what we looked at for that jumpstart phase one was uh, high-risk health workers and first responders people of any age, so age, just like race, age in and of itself was not a criterion that automatically landed a person in phase one or, or a, a demographic group in phase one. Uh, because uh, we also understand the contribution of comorbidities or living situations, such as uh, long-term care facilities or overcrowded settings, neighborhood um, or multifamily, uh, dense housing situations. And, and so that was the group that we thought should receive or be placed in phase one for the, the first tranche of vaccine available, followed by phase two, where you see teachers and other school staff, other critical workers in high risk settings. And we've you know, really gotten into the talking about people who do essential work as opposed to calling them essential workers people of any age with um, comorbidities that make them at moderately high risk, et cetera, you can see going down the line. Phase three, young adults and children, workers in other occupations um, that still have some increased risk, but not, not as high as phase one and two. And then ultimately with a robust enough supply, everyone residing in the US who didn't have access to the vaccine. And even though this is the phase, uh, when it, this says everyone residing in the US, that's because this allocation framework is for the US. The report also concludes with a chapter on how equitable allocation across the US also needs to include our participation within the global vaccine network and the WHO, and that some of the supply that we have should be donated into those causes and as well. So then, back getting back to social vulnerability, race and ethnicity, we, we identified that across all of these groups, to have equity be cross-cutting in every population group, 
Um, you can prioritize people based on CDC's Social Vulnerability Index, which some of you may use. It's a um, 15, uh, 15 measures that go into determining um, uh, the risk of harm and low resilience and poor recovery established first in determining resilience to natural disasters, but it can be applied to chronic and infectious diseases as well, and includes uh, measures such as access to transportation, income, housing, um, race and ethnicity are captured in there. But social vulnerability can be um, one of the factors that is applied in any of these phases because there's all, also the potential to prioritize within each of the phases as well. I'm only supposed to talk for 10 minutes, so there are a couple of other things I do want to tell you, um, and then we can get to some questions and discussion. Uh, what we know and what we knew was that no matter how great all this might sound, at the end of the day, it gets applied in the real world and real life. So what were the curveballs and what would be the other considerations? And because of that, chapter four of the report goes through a number of the scenarios that we needed to, we wanted people to take into consideration um, scenarios that could impact the framework and how people might think about those things. So I wanted to make sure to mention those to you because so much of what you do is in, is in the context of scenarios. So you see how much I know about modeling? I've told you everything I know about modeling. And so the ones that we took into consideration were, um, like, when is the vaccine really gonna come out? The timing and which ones will they be? We still don't know for, the, for each of the vaccines, the four that are farthest along in, in the uh, phase three trials in this country, what's their efficacy going to be? What's their safety profile? And that's overall safety and efficacy, and then safety and effic efficacy. Sorry if you hear a vacuum outside my apartment door. Safety and efficacy in any individual group, because that's also going to help determine allocation. Then there's the, the issue that I touched on earlier, which gets to acceptance, vaccine hesitance and vaccine acceptance, because no matter what we might project um, and say, well, we want to really, even social vulnerability, congregate settings, um, the social vulnerability index can take you down to uh, a census tract level of community, you know, perhaps in some tribal communities. Um, working with IHS, a jurisdiction would want to vaccinate the entire community. But acceptance of the vaccine is also going to be a consideration. We can't just assume everyone will get it. And then along with that, we don't know the degree to which for any of the vaccines, the impact is going to be one of minimizing the severity of disease versus preventing disease. And along with that, then, how much more transmissible will COVID be, be if someone gets it? So being able to then say, to move from, okay, what's the effectiveness? What, what's the, uh, in the population? And then effective in what way? Is it disease prevention or uh, mitigation of symptomatology? Different scenarios, because if you, if you only minimize symptoms, but somebody's still sick and able to transmit, there's a different kind of thinking about what the population risk might still be if you're trying to project along the way how you ultimately get to herd immunity. And then, because I know all you ever do is live in the world of all of those considerations, I might as well throw in what we, we kept saying to one another during these considerations was, and we have to keep reminding the public that even if they get a shot, they still need to wear their mask and keep their distance and wash their hands because in a certain, what happens with the epidemic in area, any area is gonna also depend on those other preventive behaviors. 